Let's just start in with um, Carla. <laughs> Certainly. Last night, I said that as I was preparing for this and was listening to everyone, I fell in love over and over and over again. But principally what I meant, since I already knew the work of Kaya uh, and uh, Caroline Shaw, was these two women. If I could come back again, <laughs> this is what I would want to be. <laughs> when we, uh, many of you were at the, uh, uh, the sonic meditation this morning. Um, Pauline Oliveros is in the generation about half before me even. John Cage opened the door and allowed us to imagine that any sound you wanted could be regarded as music. Pauline Oliveros took this in the direction of meditation, of course. And so we were invited to hear uh, these very delicate sounds uh, by Claire Chase on her flute, which at a certain point was responded to by a turtle dove that was sitting there. I mean, what a magical moment that was. But we were attending to sound as sound. Um, that is something that has uh, been fundamental to the emergence of groups like Roomful of Teeth, uh, groups like ICE, who make sounds and want us to attend to exactly that timbre, exactly that nuance. Um, when yesterday uh, Kaya asked uh, uh, her her Plutus to play that extraordinary piece. We already were introduced to that sense of just immersion in sound for the sake of sound. I don't think that the work of Roomful of Teeth or Ice really is imaginable without John Cage, Pauline Oliveros, uh, then the work that Kaya and uh, the people who have been working with uh, spectral analysis and then the diffusion of those techniques, I don't think any of those things would have been imaginable. What these two women bring to the table is both a incredible attention to sound, but as you heard in the work that uh, Carla uh, presented to us today, they are also fusing with uh, vernacular musics. This is not something we're used to hearing at Ojai. Uh, 20 years ago or so, when some of us were touting what we called postmodernism, we wanted to see a breakdown of the barrier between classical music and popular music. Both of these women have been highly trained. Uh, uh, Carla at Oberlin as a classical violinist but they have listened to all of the musics that have surrounded them and have come up with ways of fusing them, of bridging, of bringing all of these musical languages together. You may not know that Carla is uh, the founding member of a number of extraordinary ensembles. Each of those ensembles brings a different fusion to bear. Uh, her uh, group, uh, the Tin Hat, or Sleepy Time Gorilla Museum. I mean, these are very different kinds of fusions, very different kinds of musicians. And um, like Caroline Shaw, uh, she is always involved with collaborations with musicians, with performing musicians, and figuring out what you can do when you are in the presence of other very imaginative performers. So what I want to know is how a nice girl from Oberlin who was supposed to grow <laughs> up to be a classical violinist found herself working with all of these other kinds of musics and how you have developed this really extraordinary array of styles that you have brought to bear. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I have to say, I think that my whole, <laughs> um, 
Everything I've done, first of all, clearly I have a very good, healthy, defiant streak in me that um, I, I have lost hope will ever disappear. I think it's just there to stay. Um, but I also have, like you mentioned, a, co a, a, a craving for and a need for collaboration. And so everything that I, my vocabulary as an artist now is a combination of of uh, all the vigilant hyper schooling that I did very young, and then the subsequent unschooling that I did, and a kind of almost a kind of blindness. Um, I, I sometimes I, f I feel like I have a big background in learning this and the technique and the practice, and I put all those hours in. And when I do the work that I end up feeling like closest to and deepest about, it's. I always feel like a naked mole rat, like like I'm, I'm picking this and it kind of relates to this and soon I've come, I'm really not sure. I, may, I know I've written songs before, but I'm surely, I have no idea how I ever did and this one's surely not gonna work. And who, like, I always literally feel like I'm like, I'm inventing it again, and why didn't I go to school for this? <laughs> um, so as a composer, I'm, I'm kind of unschooled, but as a musician, I, I was so moved by, even as, a, even as a classical player, what I was moved most by was Bartok string quartets, for example, like super, the what you can do with other people and what like decision making and textures and visceral sounds that, that kind of enter your body and somehow fuse your experience and imagination with a certain rigorousness. And um, those conversations have been what has led me down the path, the very strange, circuitous, aesthetic path that I've gone down, is the conversations that have developed over periods of years with people that I've loved and worked with. So, for example, you mentioned Tin Hat and Sleepy Time Gorilla Museum, which are kind of like Jekyll and Hyde bands. They couldn't be farther apart from each other on the aesthetic scale, or perhaps they could be, but it'd be, be a stretch. Um, and so what they have in common is me, but um, but what they also have in common is that they're about long-term friendships, and they're about um, like both uh, both of the people in those bands I had a very you know decades long long relationships with, and we made the music we made because that. It's like you overlap these circles of people and where all the overlap happens is where that band exists. So, for, and I, I have never been concerned with genre. It's just never been anything I cared about. I mean, someone asked me recently what I used to play when I was a kid and I used to sit down at the piano and improvise all the time. And I thought about it and I think I was doing the same thing then that I'm doing now. I just playing with dissonance and, and satisfying juiciness, harmonic juiciness, and finding resonance in it. And I, I don't think I ever cared whether something was a pop song or a classical piece. And, um, and I'm so glad that I live in this century now because that's okay and that's actually more and more common, which is very exciting. And a festival like this, it's a classical festival, can have pop songs like ours. I mean, I don't know if, and that pop songs might be, I don't use that as a diminutive term. I actually fully embrace what that means because it's hard to write a good pop song. Um, so, and I, I just think like the lines are getting more porous and my experience through music as a composer has always been um, a, a combination of blind and intuitive. <laughs> Layla, could you tell us a little bit about your path to creating <laughs> Fusions. Yeah, I just thought it's like, she sounds cool. Like, yeah, I, my past feels really long when I, she got the preamble and I don't, but um, I guess I started out just thinking, when I started out, um, I guess my professors were kind of, there was, a, there was definitely a bent towards the second Viennese school. And, um, you know, Schoenberg That's and Fabian and Berg. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that, I guess it was nearly 20 years ago when I started studying composition, so that was difficult for me, and I knew I, I just knew I couldn't be a composer, 
And so I just gave up. I did, went for, for a year to university and, and gave up because I knew I could never be an old white man. And um, <laughs> I just thought, okay, it's not for me. I can't do that. And it, the other thing, actually, they also told me, like, I would always sing in my pieces or play or do something. And they said, you know, you really, if you want to be a composer, you're, you're going to have to stop doing that. And so, oh, and, in the, you know, things like you can never repeat anything ever. You have to turn it upside down or put it backwards. And so, I, yeah, I found that stuff really hard, and I just didn't really do it. And then, anyway, I went to um, Europe for a while. I watched a movie about gypsies and decided I was going to, I don't know, just live with gypsies and stuff. I got as far as going around Spain, and I, did, I, didn't, I didn't do the rest of it. After a few years, I realized I should, that I still wanted to write for orchestra, that it was still something I wanted to do. It was no good reason. It was just the sound. And so I thought the only way I can really do that is if I go and study. And so I went back to New Zealand. So I did all that stuff in Europe. Oh, and I went to visit my granddad, who was 105, in Ghana. So I didn't know that side of my family. So I had a lot of exploring to do. Um, and I also played gamelan for years. So that really influenced my music just as much as anything I studied at university did. I was studying gamelan for years. So singing and playing all the instruments, Balinese and gamelan, and um, Japanese instruments and singing. So... Um, yeah, then, so that all, like, that all bundled together and I went back to university. And by then, <clears throat> that sort of hard line of that kind of um, second Viennese school had kind of been shifting and it, 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 this new open, slightly more open environment had come in. And I think anybody that thought I was going to do something different probably just gave up on me and just let me do what I was already doing. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. I've always sung um, my pieces. Re recently, I've been concentrating um, on writing more string music, so uh, tomorrow there's two pieces of mine being played. One is uh, If the Stars Align, a string quartet at Zolk Hall, I think it's at 9 or 10 a.m. in the morning, if you're bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. And then um, also Alison is a piece I wrote for my mother, actually. She lives in New Zealand, and that is, um, that's on at 3 p.m. here, and that's for String Quartet plus Harp with Bridget Kibbe, so that's the Calder Quartet that's playing both of those. And... Um, I guess I'm at Princeton now. I'm just finishing up my PhD in composition. So fast forward lots of years of me playing music and having normal office jobs and stuff. But I played music and put out about five albums. I did one for the Italian National Radio. And so that's the kind of stuff I'll be playing tonight um, at 10.30 p.m., which is um, my solo piano and voice. So I do, I guess, the, the similar. we've got a real similar thread there, is that uh, just doing lots of different kinds of music and not really caring about genre, that's something that really resonates with me, because I, people try and ask me all the time, it's like, why do you care? You, the, people always try and ask me, like, what genre do you play? It's like, well, I don't care, why do you, you know, I don't really care, but pe people like, I think people like to know, so then I think, what did reviewers say? Then they say, I'm genre busting, and so it's like, you can't say to someone, like, I'm genre busting. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're calling it post-genre uh, now. Somebody in WNYC just called my latest album that I was, um, two EPs, that, uh, pop, art, pop, art, pop. Art, art, art pop. I like that, because yeah. I think it's a bit like art songs, what I do. I think, it, I think this does fit into the art song thing. I think it's kind of Brechtian to do that stuff. I don't know, art song tradition. But people forget about that, and they want to call it different stuff. So how do you get <laughs> to a Trayvon song? Ah, um, okay, so, yeah, one of the songs I'll play that tonight, actually, is called Negative Space, and um, that's not... Ne yeah, the, the negative space is... Um, it's heavy. It's this space that exists from being, you know, being a woman, being a person of colour, and responding to that experience in the situation that's America, you know. And for me, I, I grew up in New Zealand, and... Um, of course, there are racial issues all over the world, and many of them stem from the experience here. So it's been a really big learning curve for me as a person here, being here. I've been here maybe six years. And uh, when a brutality happens, like Trayvon Martin, or just listening today about um, Muhammad Ali, he made the connection between Emmett Till who was, I guess, killed in a similar way to Trayvon Martin, and the Viet Vietnam War. He made that connection. So just thinking about this, the, I don't know, these kinds of connections. Anyway, uh, this piece that I wrote was just in direct response, really, a visceral response to Trayvon being murdered. And um, if there's been different 
different events that happen like that for me that I, it's the only way that I can really respond is um, through music because as I think I've seen before <laughs> with Peter around, but I wish I could do something more helpful than music because um, I'm not sure how music helps, but it's the way that I have to respond as a human and I hope that people with more intelligence and money and skill than me or with kind of more relevant <laughs> occupations can also respond and then we'll have a really awesome planet for everybody. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Carla, would you talk about where some of your subject matter inspiration comes from? Content. Yeah, specifically about today's yeah, piece. Totally, yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, the, the piece today, I'm, I didn't even get a chance to really look at the program, but I imagine that you have some context for it. It was all based on dream imagery, and for me that, um, I, I, I love to, I love to do things that give us an ex, uh, uh, an excuse to uh, to kind of open open ourselves up and pick a seething piece of beauty and complication and and, and look at it. And what more than dreams can do that? It's 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 an it's a the logic of dreams is very rigorous, but it's also. Um, totally impenetrable in ways. Like when you wake up from a dream, you know that it had a reason and a rhyme, and, um, but it's often hard to explain. And that for me is such a, an opportunity, to a musical opportunity, to kind of take that, that combination of imagination and rigor and, and weave them into something. And, and the, I feel like when you ask someone, when someone gives you, or I feel like when, you, when someone tells you a dream, they're like giving you a little gift. It's like a window into, into their, you know, kind of open a little window and you can see some of the, the craziest things that go on. And um, working with that material did, did a number of things. One is that it, it really allowed me to get to know the ensemble in a beautiful way because I asked them each to, if they wanted to, this was not mandatory, but I asked them each to contribute a dream. And, um, uh, and so they kind of had a, a real stake in the piece. And as Tom pointed out, they really played it with such love. And I was so thankful for that because I really feel like they were very kind of um, involved in it. And uh, like Nathan's dream, which, which is the first piece um, where he finds a door in his own apartment that he's never seen before, and he opens it up, and he finds this room that's been right under his nose the whole time, this big, luminous, beautiful space. And he says it changes the, for months afterwards. It's a recurring dream. It changes the way he walks through his life. And just what, how powerful that imagery is, that just something that happened from his unconscious totally shifts the way that he walks through the world. And like that just shows the, the power of our own kind of thought process. And that, to me, was such a wonderful jumping off point into so many different areas and so much just a way of kind of looking at, at, at uh, kind of lifting the hood on ourselves and each other. Um, one of the songs is about a recurring dream that I have that I haven't had in some years, thank you, where my teeth fall out. And I know that's such an archetypal thing. Everyone has that dream sometime where your teeth fall out. And it's not like violent. They just kind of like crumble into my hand. And, but it feels like a whole city is falling down. It feels like the buildings are crumbling and it's like sped up time. And there's no real way to convey that except to dive in and like you know, make, it, make it happen in music. So, um, and that song, which is called Rocks and Concrete, was actually also inspired by a band that I really love um, from the 1970s called Art Bears, um, which is a... Um, one of the very early, I would say, art, art pop bands that really walked that line right down the middle between pop song and art song um, fearlessly before people were really doing that. So that particular song references one of my kind of heroes in this early pioneers in this strange genre we're working in. In between visits to Princeton, you're also teaching music classes at Sing Sing Prison. Would you talk about, you know, that uh, dimension and vector in your life and in your music? Yeah, so um, I have been teaching for Musicambia, 
Um, that's musicambia.org. Um, and that is an initiative of having a faculty a bit like the ELSA STEMA system where you give um, classical instruments, and in this case, not just string instruments, because I think it's usually string instruments, but there's also brass instruments and um, keyboards and stuff. So um, music can be a fundraisers for those, <coughs> and then teaches the instruments. And I teach theory, and because there weren't enough instruments and we took on more people than we had originally planned, because some, there was so much interest and everybody was so great that, that went for the initial days, we also I offered uh, singing along with um, Elliot, who's another um, one of the faculty. So yeah, we teach us every couple of weeks and go in, we would go in and do that. I haven't done it for a little bit, but um, yeah, I will be doing that again in September. So yeah, it's one of the things, I think when I was away, because I often go away and play music and come back to the States, and when I was away last time, I was, I, people say, oh, you know, you're looking forward to going home. And I was like, ah, the thing I'm really looking forward to doing is going back and teaching at Sing Sing, yeah. <laughs> Um, and that that's, I guess that's not just the experience, I, I think uh, for me the reason for, for that is because um, it, yeah, teaching music in a maximum security correctional facility showed me that um, the power of community, and I guess that's what you're talking about, it's, it's, it's this this collaboration and community, you think it's somewhere else, it's, it's gonna be in, oh, it's gonna be in Berlin or something, you know, it's gonna be, maybe it is for you, but it, it's gonna be somewhere else. And in, in fact, if you're a musician enough time, it, it's in lots of different places, but it's there, it's all over the place. And it could be just right here. And music just does that wherever music is, it creates a community, like this community. Like I see Peter just say hi to somebody that walks past that, because people keep coming. Music does that and you can't, it's not to do with money, it's not to do with the place, it could be the uncoolest place in the world, but when music's there, it sort of creates this sense of togetherness. And it's interesting to see that in a situation like a prison where you wouldn't think that and where it's very difficult for people to trust each other. Trust really comes alive. And the men told us that, um, you know, because you obviously just, it's You just answered dangerous. your previous question about whether <laughs> creating music about a certain topic or it is worthwhile and actually effective. I'm just yeah, gonna say okay. you just answered that. <laughs> Amen, <you>. it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and the other thing is that uh, I like to say about this experience is that it also is joy. So you can see that in people who get given an instrument for the first time and get to play it. And I think that it's something that it's easy for us to forget as musicians, and the way that it's easy to forget that boiling, e boiling an egg could be fun, or for me, going to the supermarket is fun, um, because that's the time I get to chill out and rest and I get to cook. So anything that is creative, it gives. It gives to you. And if you choose to see it as a chore, it sucks. But if you choose to see what you do as creative, then it's a, it's a blessing. And I guess, you know, mm -hmm. seeing people stuck in a situation like that any, it gives us the realisation that anything is a joy. Going to the supermarket, I mean, most people in the world couldn't buy what we could at the supermarket, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a luxury place, you know? You get to go get your organic blueberries or whatever. So <laughs> that's... <laughs> so I think, to I think just appreciation, I guess, is the thing that... Yeah, appreciation and joy are things that you really can see there and you wouldn't expect to learn that from people in prison, yeah. but that's possible. So... You may know that the great experimentalist Henry Cowell, who influenced everyone who came after, Cage, Oliveros, everyone, was convicted of homosexuality and was sent to maximum security prison in San Quentin. Um, while he was there, he set to work and organized all of his fellow inmates and put together a band. Um, and, you know, so that, that sense of, you know, what you have around you, the, the human beings, the resources, you can put them together and you can make music, even in some of the most dire conditions. Which lets me mention the next concert that we're going to have in a few minutes. Dina Elba Didi and her band have come all the way from Cairo 
to the Ojai Festival. And we have to thank um, specifically Senator Dianne Feinstein's office that they made it into America. Um, it was a challenge to invite uh, 12 people with long Arab names to a known radical center of Ojai. <laughs> and so certain authorities did step in. Uh, and in, in 20 minutes, you will see what you are being protected from. Uh, just to say, we all heard uh, in the last years, of course, there was the thrilling moment of the so-called Arab Spring and a sense that democracy might be possible in parts of the world that have labored under dictatorships that have entirely been selected and exclusively supported by the United States government. And the idea that there could be the beginning of a people's movement in the streets, and as you know, young Arab artists were in the vanguard over and over and over again. Now, of course, the situation in Egypt is quite different under a military regime. Frequent jailing of artists, journalists, and human rights workers. So it's astonishing tonight to have Dina Elwadidi and her band here to perform for us in Ojai and as these women have pointed out, carrying a message that only music can carry. One of which is, you know, when people talk about political art, <laughs> I just always want to correct them and say, excuse me, it's about lifting politics. It's not about reducing art to politics. <laughs> it's about elevating politics to art. <laughs> it's, like, it's like truly going over the heads of those people and truly raising the level of conversation, of understanding, of aspiration, and of where we all are headed. It's the reminder not just to look at your feet, but to look at the mountains where you're going, to recognize that we're not there yet. Music is created, and art is created as something to do while you wait to get to where you hope to be a way to remind yourself who also you would like to be and how you would like to behave and what you would like to have around you and what you hope for for your kids. And in that sense, it's not so much the protest song of the moment, although that's also essential. And I want to mention tonight that the Santa Paula blast in uh, on Sunday evening begins with one of my favorite bands, Los Jornaleros. They're a band of migrant workers in Los Angeles who experienced an immigration raid, lost many close friends, and decided someone had to hear what happened to them. And some memorial for their friends had to be created, and they started a band and they called themselves Los Jornaleros, the journalists, to report in music what is going unreported in America. And so, yes, music has this urgent question of not just handing along the information, but handing along with the information depth of feeling, depth of context, depth of humanity, depth of recognition, of complexity, depth of addiction to detail, refusing to generalize, and also to give everyone the strength to stand for what we really stand for, and remind everyone of where we would like to be standing and with whom. Dina, well, <laughs> it's, it's what's coming is Dina, and what's very moving is to hear this music of very pure joy coming out of Egypt in this very difficult time. Dina uses very consciously deep, deep knowledge, like these two women, 
of traditions, Nubian music, the Tsar music, which is the traditional healing music of Arab women, particularly in Egypt. Dina uses this music in her own beautiful voice and body, but in a way that is completely fresh in her own generation. And the urgency and pleasure of this band is, I think, one of their great gifts to a nation that's living through difficult times. I would just also mention that um, Dina became uh, 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 her linked to uh, Gilberto Gil and went to Brazil, worked with him. He has done concerts with her. And this uh, beautiful sense that these women, and I think all of us try to represent now, which is none of us are culturally this or that, but the idea that new Egyptian music is connected to new Brazilian music, that all over the world we're in so many different types of solidarity, all over the world there's so many types of shared spaces, shared dreams, shared imagination, and that we are not isolated. In fact, in fact, we now share so much more than we don't share. And so the musical lines are now there to prove that. We're all listening to each other. We're all influenced by each other. We're all inspired by each other. And it's no longer appropriation, which is what it was a generation ago. It's actual dialogue, thanks to the internet, thanks to being able to travel, these are our friends. And that dialogue, you know, if international business can do it, why not artists and why not human rights workers? Let's make the planet a series of song lines. I might say in Peter's, uh, to Peter's credit, Usually, a new music festival concentrates on people who have come through a tradition. They are recognized as being in the avant-garde, but that usually means only North America and Europe. And to offer a program in which there's no differentiation between uh, Pauline Oliveros, Kaya Sarriaho, Dina, uh, South Asian music, all of these things which Peter is insisting are part of where we are today. These aren't being cordoned off as here are some exotic musics, here are some things that are the continuation of who we are, but these musics are all who we are today. Um, and I think this uh, just looking at the program that we had put in our hands when we came to the festival is, is a real eye and ear opener. This is not the way festivals typically are organized. And I just want to say bravo, Peter. Well, let's put it this way. I'd like to, <laughs> yes, I agree. Thank you, Susan, for saying it. What's so great is, it, is festivals are the place where you can do this. And now more and more places are behaving like festivals. And I think, as you said, Carla, jazz festivals have been doing this for a while. Nobody's been able to say what jazz is or is not anymore at all. Nobody can say what classical music is or is not anymore at all. I think, for me, it's about how deeply it comes from somebody's heart. That's the actual question. Amen. Please enjoy the rest of the evening, everyone. Thank you so much. Here comes the second night of the Ojai Festival. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.